Sleep disturbance is really common. Up to 50% of the population may be having some sort of sleep disruption at any given time. So this can range from the simple primary self-limited insomnia of, gee, my daughter's getting married and I can't sleep for three weeks. And then after it's all over, everything's back to normal. It could be as serious as something like obstructive sleep apnea causing disruption in sleep and leading to long-term health problems. It could be other lifelong problems. We've talked on this show before about restless leg syndrome. It could be something more uncommon like narcolepsy. So there are lots of different sleep disorders. The more severe sleep disorders probably comprise something less than 10% of the population. Hmm. Even insomnia now we're beginning to learn has long reaching social and health influences. We know that people with insomnia can have significant decreases in productivity at work. They can have problems in family and interpersonal relationships. There's beginning to be some insight into other health problems that can be associated with insomnia. So even though insomnia we may look at as a inconvenience, it does have some significant burdens both to the patient and to society. So even something like that can have significant impact on people. The, the really severe things that happen in, in sleep medicine are things like obstructive sleep apnea that really do have long range serious health consequences. Let's talk about obstructive sleep apnea since it sounds like it is, if not the most serious, one of the most serious sleep disorders. What is it? It is caused by obstruction in the airway during sleep causing this funny word apnea, which from the Greek means absence of breathing. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the tongue or the soft palate or the soft tissues on the sides of the airway, including the tonsils, if tonsils are still present in the airway, the airway collapses, that obstructs the airway, can result in snoring, although snoring is not always present in obstructive sleep apnea. When the airway collapses, it causes interruptions in sleep. People become more disrupted in sleep. That leads to daytime sleepiness because of poor sleep. The biggest consequences of obstructive sleep apnea are the long-term increase in risk for cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, such as stroke, heart attack, congestive heart failure, that people can develop as a result of obstructive sleep apnea. I have had patients in the past who either before they got treated or because they didn't stay on their treatment died during their sleep, but it is a rather uncommon occurrence. If you're going to die of sleep apnea, it's going to be as a result of some other type of event mm -hmm. that, that was impacted by the obstructive like sleep Like you apnea. just mentioned with heart, heart disease. Heart attack or yeah. stroke. Yeah. Yeah. Most people come to my clinic because they complain to their primary care doctor or perhaps their cardiologist or near nose and throat or somebody that they have gone to see with a specific complaint and during that interview with that physician it comes up that, hey, I'm sleepy, I'm fatigued, I'm tired, something's not right, I'm not sleeping well. If the spouse is along with the patient, then there may be some more information, hey, there's snoring, there's restless sleep, gets up in the night, lots of getting up to the bathroom during the night, all of these things can be indi indicative of obstructive sleep apnea and then that will typically lead to a referral to come in to see us. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty remarkable what you can do in your sleep lab. I mean, maybe just spend a minute and tell people what happens when they do come into the sleep lab. Well, our sleep lab is really state of the art. It's a wonderful facility. We have bedrooms that are not hospital rooms. So the, these testing rooms, when people come there, they're designed to feel a lot more like uh, I'm in a comfortable place rather than I'm stuck in a hospital somewhere. They're not hospital beds, they're not gurneys that people sleep on, they're real honest to goodness queen size beds. People come in, they have a real mattress and it has a feeling like home. In the evening when they come in for sleep studies, they meet with my technicians somewhere between 7 and 9 p.m. It takes about an hour to an hour and a half to get all of the testing equipment attached to the patient. There are probes that need to be pasted 
to the scalp and the face and then things that need to be applied to the body to allow us to measure breathing and heart rate and movement and the, the electroencephalogram, the EEG, so that we can tell if people are awake or asleep. Uh, people are monitored by video so that if there are what we call parasomnias, if there's some sort of activity during the night, we can look at that and evaluate that, determine what may have caused that, and then we let people pretty much sleep to when they're ready to get up. There are a lot of sleep centers around the country, in fact most who will typically tell people at 6.30 we'll boot you out of here, and we've made the decision if you typically sleep until 9 o'clock in the morning, then at 9 o'clock in the morning you'll get up and we'll get you cleaned up and let you go home. Hmm. So it turns like out to be a pretty restful night of sleep. No, it's not. <laughs> it but makes you reasonable. wonder because I picture these people with all these wires and things all over them, but they really can sleep. Uh, most people come in and sleep just fine. We'll have an occasional patient who can't sleep. The most common report after these studies that patients tell me is that it was about like I normally sleep at home, mm -hmm. maybe slightly worse. So when patients tell me I sleep horribly, I tell them you'll probably sleep horribly in the lab as well because that's the way you sleep. Yeah. And if you come in and tell me I really sleep pretty well, more than likely you'll sleep pretty well in the lab as well. Interesting. Parasomnias are an activity during the night that look like wake but are actually asleep and so we call them a para almost like sleep a parasomnia this is the sleepwalking the sleep talking that you see your children do mm -hmm. it can be something even more significant as adults we get reports from people who are sleepwalking and leave the house and maybe wander in the streets and have no idea that that has happened there have been reports of people sleep driving. Mm. Really fascinating. There have been a couple of instances where there have been criminal activity that has happened as a result of someone sleepwalking and the person was exonerated because it became very clear that it was not intentional. The person was wow. asleep. What we do know is that children have parasomnias very commonly. And we're all aware of that. We've, we've all got one or two kids that you can bet will be up wandering at night or will be talking, doing something during the night. And we can plan on that two or three times a week. We'll have other children that they'll never make a peep, they'll never move. You go in in the morning, they're still in the posi same position that they went to sleep in when you tuck them in to bed <laughs> at night. What's the incidence of that? I would guess at least 30 to 40 percent, although I don't believe I've seen anything published on that. In adults it becomes much less frequent. In children we expect that most of those parasomnias are normal, natural, we don't need to worry about them. In adults they become more problematic. The only reason why we worry about a kid with parasomnia is, like a patient told me recently, I'm worried about little Johnny because we check on the bedroom, he's gone. The first thing we look for is the front door. It's standing open, now we've got to go find him. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's always abnormal for an adult to have parasomnia activity. But it may not mean anything serious or severe. So, for instance, a person who says, I talk, I walk, whatever in sleep, who also snores and has daytime sleepiness, has maybe high blood pressure, okay, we're worried that that's obstructive sleep apnea and that not breathing may actually trigger those parasomnia activities mm -hmm. during the night. And that then may be a sign or a symptom of something like obstructive sleep apnea. Might also be something that would be a sign of simply very deep sleep, perhaps a medication reaction. Somebody's taking a medication that they're sleeping quite deeply, but this medicine's causing enough side effect that they're bothered at certain points in their sleep, so they're doing things that would be something we wouldn't be nearly as worried about unless it were causing problems. The main thing we're looking at in adults is if you're talking, walking, anything abnormal during the night and you are sleepy in the daytime, something Go is see wrong. your sleep doctor. Ambien is, if not the most commonly prescribed medication, one of the 
most commonly prescribed medications in this country. It, for those who might have watched the news, there was a congressman in Washington, D.C. who was arrested DUI because he took Ambien and started driving, and when he was pulled over, he was not awake. <laughs> he was asleep. Mm -hmm. This happens. I had a patient report to me that after taking Ambien, husband woke up, she was gone. The car was gone. The garage door was standing open. Mm. Sometime just before sunup, the police finally located her wandering in the desert, car with four flat tires oh, in her nightgown, had no idea where she was until the officer awakened her oh, dear. in the desert. Really? Wow, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Does it happen very often? No, but when it does, it's a significant problem. Mm -hmm. That's much less common with Ambien. The more common parasomnia is sleep eating disorder, mm -hmm. which can be pretty problematic because people tend to gain weight if they eat a lot at oh, night. Oh, of course. And they have no idea that they're eating. Wow, and how common is that? How common would it be that someone would be getting up and eating something in the night and then do they just go back to bed so they don't even realize they've eaten something? That's exactly what happens. Hmm. Less than 1%. Mm -hmm. But if you're the less than 1%, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. The typical tip-offs that this might be going on is finding wrappers, crumbs, plates next to your bed, or getting out of bed, going to the kitchen in the morning, finding food stuffs left out, and no one in the family will admit to having been involved in that. Well, they're probably telling the truth unless they're the ones that are doing the eating, but they wouldn't remember that they were up doing it anyway. If it's caused by Ambien, we stop the Ambien, try a different medication. That will typically resolve that problem if it is associated with that medication. Mm -hmm. There are reports, though, of patients who have sleep eating that is not caused by any drug. It is simply a behavioral problem during sleep. These always arise out of the deepest sleep that we have, what we call delta sleep or stage three sleep. Why is that? Because if you are partially awakened or aroused during that deep sleep, you won't wake up all the way, but you may wake up into this parasomnia state, mm -hmm. almost asleep, not quite, almost awake, not quite. This in-between area where you can be up and engage in complex behavior, but your brain is still sound asleep. In fact, if we measured the EEG in these people, they would have this deep, slow wave, high voltage brain waves. Mm -hmm. They are not awake. Sleep hygiene really is a critical part of improving sleep overall. It won't solve more serious sleep problems, but it will go a long ways toward improving the quality of one's sleep. Right, like you mentioned sleep apnea at the beginning of the show, that's something physiological it sounds like that's causing that and you're going to need some kind of help to, to correct that. What is the typical treatment um, for sleep apnea? Well, this is the reason why people don't line up to come see me if they suspect they have sleep apnea. They wait until their symptoms are really bad, and then they'll come in because they know that we're going to talk about things like CPAP, which is a machine and a mask with a hose that blows air into the airway and opens the airway. <coughs> people don't like that very much, at least when they start, but most people, after they've been wearing them for a while, get to the point where they really enjoy using them. There are surgeries that can be done, kind of miserable recovery after the surgeries, but they can be effective for some people. There are some dental devices. It's really nice recently because a couple of years ago, Medicare decided to start covering these dental devices for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. Many private insurance companies have now followed suit with that. So we have a lot more options for treatment of, of obstructive sleep apnea besides CPAP. But CPAP remains the workhorse. It is the standard of care. There is nothing that is more successful than CPAP. It's just difficult to learn how to tolerate. Mm -hmm. How long does it usually take to adapt? I've had people who adapt as quickly as the first night. Wow. And others who take months. 
to really adapt and become comfortable, 20% of my patients will not be able to use CPAP. They're just on discomfort, not motivated, whatever that might be, but they are unable to use CPAP. But 80% do well over the long term. But we know that poor sleep will result in decreased productivity at work, problems with interpersonal relationships, family, friends, whatever that might be, and some of them can lead to serious health problems. Professional help can make a big difference, and sometimes just over-the-counter remedies or sleep hygiene remedies can solve the problem without the need for professional intervention. So if you have a problem with your sleep, don't try and fight it off on your own get help. There's great help available in the community and we should probably end the program with giving your telephone number Dr. Watkins if someone has more questions or wants to give you a call. Telephone number area code 435-251-3940. They can help you get an appointment and be happy to see people.